So tonight we're going to talk about functions. And um, anybody who joined me last week or watched the video knows that um, reusability is one of my favorite topics, so we're going to talk about it again this week. So yes, more reusability. Yippee! Um, so this is our second foray into reusing code. And why does reusability matter? Reusability matters because you don't want to always copy and paste your code. As a developer, you want to write as few lines of code as possible so that you don't have to maintain it. And also, it's just better. Your code is more efficient if it's not having to go through extra lines and extra processes. Um, and so how is this reusability different than the reusability we saw last week with loops? This week it's different because we get to name it. So we now get to say, I have this block of code, and I want this block of code to have a name so that I can just use that block of code wherever I want by its name. So you actually are calling it by its name. You might give it some information, um, and then it'll do what it needs to do. And this is a precursor to when you're actually able to encapsulate lots of things. Um, and we'll get to that in week eight when we do objects. But this is our first foray into naming our own functions. So we're naming a block of code. And it's everything. Um, it has basics and there's some new keywords. So um, what are the function basics? You're grouping code. The code is generally grouped because it has a specific purpose. Let's say you're doing some kind of a transform or you're doing some kind of a search and you have to, um, you know, you have to pick out the right results. Or you want to hook up to a database, but you don't want to have that same, the, the same information in 10 different places in your code. You want one place in your code that's called hook up to database and you want to reuse that again and again and again. Um, and this is also the beginning of writing data-driven code. Now, it's not something that Zybooks really talks about, but it really is um, a huge concept when you're coding. You want to write your scripts so that they are expecting certain data but they're not expecting certain values. Now, what's the difference between data and values? Well, data is just your variables that are holding something. And you know if it's supposed to be an integer or a string or what kind of things you're expecting. But you're not writing your code so that it will only handle the number 2 as opposed to the number 10. So that's kind of an example of data-driven code. So um, the basics of defining a function. We got some new keywords. We're going to look at DEF, D-E-F. And that is the biggest new keyword for this week. DEF says I'm defining a function. So um, it tells Python first that you're not going to execute anything in the local scope of this function just yet. The only time the function will get executed is when you call it, not when you define it. So the definition is a placeholder. Python will later come back and run that code when you tell it to. But the def command does not tell it to run the code. The def command says, take this block of code and hold on to it until I call it by name. After def, you always have the name of the function. Now, function names are very similar to variable names. You can't use spaces. There's not a lot of special characters that you can use. Um, excuse me. And this function name needs to be unique to every other function name in your running module. And then what you see is an open and close parenthesis. I'm sorry. Um, so. Yeah, we'll get to the code block in a second. Then what you see are opening and closing parentheses. Now, the opening and closing parentheses 
right now don't have anything in them but they will as we go on in this module and then don't forget the colon just like if statements just like loops this is dealing with local scope code so you're gonna have to tell it you have to tell Python okay I'm done defining my function now so these are the lines of code that I want you to keep in the function so you, that you're grouping by this name in case in this case the name is print pattern and then underneath that we have the local scope and the local scope in this case is just print and a bunch of stars it's important that you again understand the difference between the global scope and the local scope because only things inside the local scope of this function will be executed when you call print patterns so function definition is started with the word def um, a function always requires opening and closing parentheses they can be empty so the basics of calling a function to um, the world okay so now we've got our definition our definition is def print pattern and now I want to call it later on in the code and yes that means that every time you define a function it has to be defined before you call it now the way I like to do my code is I like to define all of my functions at minimum above where my code is my code execution is going to start oftentimes I will put that into its own module so I can just reference it from the module and pull it in either way your function has to be defined before it can be called Python if you don't will simply say I don't know what print pattern is so what we have here is we have a function call to print pattern so I'm using the name and when I make that function call that's the point at which Python is going to go back and it's going to try and execute the lines of code in the local scope so the output in this case would just be the five stars and that's because that's when Python called it so what do we have here okay and I can call it again again we're gonna go back print pattern print pattern we're gonna go back up Python's gonna look up print pattern and it's gonna run the the um, code inside the local scope of the function and you know like well why do I just need to call it twice well sometimes and oftentimes what you will do is you will have a function that is called within a loop so let's assume I'm writing a game and in that game I have to every time a user makes a play I have to tell them you know these are your options you can go north south east or west well, I don't want to write that 15 times so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put an introduction or make a function called move between rooms which is something you're going to need to do and I'm going to put that inside my game loop so every time I enter a direction and I call I will then call move between rooms and my move between rooms will either move my current room or it's going to give me an error so that's the reason why you're going to want to use functions if for nothing else you need to understand them for your game okay function has to be defined for its use and um, you always call a function by its name once you call it Python will then run it so um, and you can have more than one oh this is arguments that's right so we have our def keyword again so we're going to define a function we're not using it yet we're just defining it I have a function called print total inches I then have these three those two wonderful things called parameters you'll notice I still have the opening and closing parentheses and I still have the colon at the end what is a parameter a parameter is a variable and it's usable in the local scope of that function only and it is a place for 
you to send data into the function. This is part of the data-driven nature of things. I don't know what the value of num feet is going to be. I don't about know what the value of num inches is going to be. But I know that when I have num feet, I want to multiply it by 12. And then I'm going to add the number of inches, and I'm going to print the total number of inches in this function. So that's what these parameters are. They are placeholders. They are variable names. I will not explicitly assign num feet a value. The, func the calling part of the code, the co part of the code that calls the function, will in fact um, set the values that will be num feet and num inches. And all parameters are always separated by comma. And then the local scope is just total inches. That's the code block, and it is in the local scope. We know it's in the local scope because it's been indented just the same way with if statements, just the same way with for and while loops. To, to say that it's in the local scope, it has to be indented. OK. The parameters, just, let, just to make sure I made that clear, the parameters are variables that only exist for use in the local scope. That's it. They don't exist anywhere else. Okay. And the value of the parameters provided by a function call. So let's actually go out and do a little code a little earlier tonight. Because, um, okay. I want to just, I want to get the idea across. That um, that because I think a lot of students so far we've executed code sequentially. If you see a line of code, it gets executed um, unless it's inside a local scope, and then it, depending on what the condition is, you may or may not execute it. Well, this is different because the code inside of a function may no may not be um, it may never be executed it just if it's never called. So let's just take a look and do challenge 511. Okay, so I'm going to use my friendly, friendly handy dandy debugger because we all know how much I like the debugger. Now, the first thing that you'll see when I hit the debugger is it didn't stop at line three. It stopped at line seven. So let me do that again. We're going to hit the debugger. And the first line of code that it tries to execute is at line seven. So it skipped, or we think it skipped, lines two, three, four, two, three, and four. It didn't really skip them. Python said, OK, I have this thing called print pattern. And I'm going to take that code and I'm going to put it in memory over here. And when somebody uses the words print pattern with parentheses, I'm going to go back and then I'm going to execute the code. So if I step over into my loop, it's just for i in range 2. So I'm going to run it twice. And I'm going to call print pattern. Now at this point, I now execute the code in the local scope of that function. So I'm going to print some stars. I'm going to print some pound signs. There's what's going on in the console. And now I'm back here. I've just finished print pattern. I go up to the top of the loop. Um, I is currently 0. It's just changed to 1. I'm going to call print pattern again. I'm going to step into, and by the way, this is this is a new thing on the debugger. Currently, we've always done step over. Step into says I'm on a function, so I'm going to step into the function, so in case I didn't set a breakpoint. Now I'm back at line 3. I'm going to execute line 3, 1, 2, and now I'm done. So that is what happens in Python when you're dealing with a function. Nothing happened from an execution standpoint until we actually called it.
Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about parameters because we have our definition for this function here. We just looked at it. And I've got two parameters, num feet and num inches. So let's see what happens. Let's see what Professor Lisa does. I'm going to input num feet and num inches. And I'm going to call print total inches. And so my num feet and num inches in, is now those, those variables exist in the global scope. And num feet in the global scope has 5, and num inches in the global scope has 8. So what I don't want you to do is get confused that num feet in the function call is always going to be num feet in total inches. They are completely separate because of the scope. The global scope num feet can have a different value than the local scope num feet. The only time they match is when you call the print total inches function. So when I call it, what happens? Well, num feet is going to be 5, and num inches is going to be 8. And so I have passed the values to the print total function call using arguments. And the arguments is in the call to print total inches. So now I have num feet is 5 and num inches is 8. So num feet is 5, num inches is 8. I'm going to now say print total inches is 68. Okay, an argument is a value that is passed to a function. That's all an argument is. A function call ha as a rule, and we're going to break this in a little bit, um, a function call must have the same number of arguments as parameters in the function definition. So what does that mean? So let's go out and look at this one. And we'll talk about what that means. Oh, which one is this? Sorry. Um, five, two, three. Okay, five, two, three. Set up the configuration. Five, three. Okay, so now I just have my print total inches. Um, and so let's take a look at what this means and what could happen, because I want to start showing you errors now as well. So let's just run this through real quick. Can everybody please? Hi Scott, can you mute? Can we give you any homework? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Scott, can you please mute? Yeah, I guess not. Let's go to attendees. Uh, there we go. Okay. Good. So let's go back into PyCharm. So what I want to do is I'm going to run through this once and then I'm going to break it in a couple different ways. So we've already started it. I'm on the console. It's going to... I'm going to enter the number of feet, and the number of feet is going to be 4, just because I want to say 4. And then the number of inches is going to be 2. Um, and, whoops, I didn't step over. My bad. So I have num feet is 4, num inches 2. So now I'm going to print total inches. I'm going to step in. And you'll see that num feet and num inches is 2. And I'm going to make my calculation and I'm going to print my total inches. And I'm going to now call it with the arguments swapped. So now I have print total inches, but I'm going to put num inches where it was feet and num feet where it was inches. So let's step into that and we will notice here 
that num inches, or sorry, num feet is two and num inches is four. And that's because the variable names mean nothing. Absolutely nothing. The variable names are just that. They're names and they're placeholders. Um, and I could have been X and Y. It could have been Fred and Wilma. It depends on their order. Argument placement is all about order. The name doesn't matter. In fact, I could have put two and four in there. It wouldn't have mattered. I could have put the values directly in. And so be careful. I don't want you to get into the mindset that the variable in the definition of the function has to be named the same as the variable in the call to the function. The names don't matter. So now I'm going to do this again. I'm going to print 28. So it's very, it's very easy to see that by swapping num inches and num feet, you get a different answer. And so that's part of what data-driven code is. Now, I want to break this a little bit. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do that. And of course, um, PyCharm gives us all of the nasties. And now it comes down here. It says total inches, ident indent error. So this is, again, one of those errors that Python will actually tell you what's really broken. Okay, so that's broken, but that kind of isn't and kind of is. So I have this total inches, and it tells me it has an unreferenced error. So if I run it, it says name total inches is not defined. Well, you're looking at line six, and it certainly looks to me like name total inches is defined. Um, but that's deceptive because you're not in the same scope. So if you're in the same scope, then you're good. If you're not, there's a problem. But let me also show you something that can be where you won't get the error, but you won't get the right answer. It's a logic error. It's not a syntax error. So if I, OK, OK? If I have defined out in my global scope someplace total inches and I've set it equal to 10, you will notice now that um, this doesn't show up red anymore. And if I run it, it's going to want to know. It's going to say print total inches. That's the first thing that it did. Let me run it again. So if I run it. Let's actually do this. Let's stop it. Okay. Uh, let's debug it. So the first line it hits is five. Total inches is in the global space. I step over. I'm going to set up my function. And now all of a sudden, I'm at line eight. I shouldn't be at line eight. Line eight, the print total inches, should only happen when I call it. But because I did not define it, and I didn't add it to the local scope, because I didn't tab, I can run into a logic error. Because these total inches are not the same as these total inches. It's just the way Python works, and it can be somewhat maddening. But if in some, somewhere in the global scope I have named a variable, the same as a variable inside the function, and I don't get my indentation right, I could very well end up with a logic error. Because that's what this is. This is just a very simple logic error. I will always get total inches to be print first. Sorry. I'm having trouble understanding what step in does. Yes, I can do that. Um, let me finish. And then, okay, that's where I was. So I, if you can cause a logic error very easily. So be very careful about what you name your variables, especially now that we're definitely dealing with local scope and global scope. 
This total inches is in the global scope. This total inches is in, the, is in the local scope, and they are not the same. You will notice that I printed 10. And so when I step over, oh, sorry. Oh, it's waiting, I think. Yeah, so we'll go four. We'll go two. So I have four and two. So now let me explain step in. I know this is a function call. Line 12 is a function call. I know it because I wrote print total inches. And I, it has an opening and closing quote. There's no colon because there doesn't have to be on a function call. Only on the definition. And then I've got these two arguments that are going to it. So I want to, let's say I don't have this breakpoint here. I want to look at what happens inside this function. So when I use the step in, it takes me into that code. It takes me right in to the first line in the local scope of that code. So I went from line 12 back to line 7. So that's what step in does. It says, I know I'm on a function, so I'm going to go inside that function so I can see what's happening on each line of the code. No problem. So now, here's part of the logic error. I'm going to create total inches. So my total inches is going to be like 12 or something. But you'll notice I never printed it. And I didn't print it because line 8 is not in the correct scope. Line 8 is in the global scope. So it won't print it because it wasn't on that line to execute. It's already executed line 8. It executed line 8 way back here. So make sure you get things in the correct scope. So when I move this back over, everything is good. And I don't need this total inches here, but I just wanted to add it to make a point on the difference between local and global scope. What happens if you have a variable that's the same name as the local scope as it is in the global scope? The other error I want to show you is this. I'm just going to remove an argument. That's all I did. I just removed num inches. So now I'm going to run it. I'm going to say 10 this time and 12. And then I get Print total inches, missing one required positional argument. So, and it says num inches. So it's referring to this num inches, but what is happening is that I didn't give it enough arguments. I only gave it num feet. I needed to give it num inches. So, and actually, let's do something different. I'm going to say feet and inches. So we can make a little bit better distinction. So we're going to say feet, inches, I'm going to say inch, inches, and feet, just so we know. And I'm going to run this again. Okay, and what I want to show you here is, um, actually let me do this, because I want it to give us the error again. When I run it, I'm going to print 10, 12, and now I get a trace back, and you'll see that the argument, that the error still says num inches. It doesn't say it doesn't say inches. It says num inches, and that is because it's not talking to me about anything in the global scope at this point. It is talking about the way I called this function, and I didn't call this function right. I didn't call it right because I didn't give it two arguments. You have an argument here and an argument here. And I've only got one there. So if I do inches and I run it, I do 10 and 12, then I get it to give me the correct answers. How are we doing on time? Okay. Beat it up a little bit. Okay. So argument order. I just pretty much talked about argument order, but we'll run through this pretty quickly. So if I change num feet and num inches, and I put, I do 5 as num feet, 8 as num inches, I'm going to have 5 and 8. So we have num inches and num feet. I just switched the, the variables. 
that are um, in the global scope in the function call and I'm going to have 8 and 5 now instead of 5 and 8 like I had before. And so num speed is going to be 8. It's 8 times 12 plus 5 and the total is 101. So just swapping arguments, I changed the outcome of that function by just have, just went going from num feet to and then num inches and then swapping them to num inches and num feet. Arguments are positional. The names don't matter. Okay, so this is pyramid volume. So um, we're going to basically calculate the volume of a pyramid. So def, I'm defining a function. Pyramid volume is the function name. In this case, I have three parameters, all of them separated by commas. I've got my local scope, which is just my code block. And here I have a, a new keyword called return. So in the last two slides, we talked about sending information in to the function with arguments. So I can actually pass values in. Well, the other part of that is that I want to sometimes pass values back out of a function call. Let's say I've got a really complex mathematical calculation and I'm not good with math, so I'm not going to try and, you know, make up anything in my head, but I've got a really complex mathematical calculation and all I want to do is return what that, the, the result of that mathematical calculation is. How do I do that? Because I want to send it from the local scope back to the calling scope, which is in our case will be the global scope. How do I do that? Well, there's a new keyword called return. And return says, take the value of any variable to my right and send it back to the global scope, to whatever called it. Well, that's what a return does. So let's go and take a look at this a little bit differently because I only gave you half of what a return does. The other half is I got to give it a variable to put that information into. So here we have our function. We just looked at it. I'm going to enter the length. I'm going to enter the width. I'm going to enter the height. Now the next thing is different. Okay, well I have 4.5 length, width, and height. But if you look at the line of code that we're on, I have on the left hand side of a single equal sign, I have a variable named pyramid. The equal sign, and then I have to the right of that, I have a function call. And this is because I know that my pyramid volume function is going to give me a value. Okay, just like when we do, you know, a split, we do split on a string so we get a list back. Well, in this case, I'm going to get a value back that's going to be the volume of the pyramid. So I, I just, I mean, it's just like any other assignment in Python. You got a variable, so on the left hand side of a single equal sign, you got something on the right hand side. And in this case, the new thing is on the right hand side, we have a function call that is going to return something. So these are positional. We just send in our arguments on that call. And then our pyramid volume calculates. It's 9.45. The return function means that I am now going to set the value of the pyramid, val the pyramid variable in the global scope to 9.45, which was calculated inside my pyramid volume function. So call a function by using the name and providing arguments. Always remember to define a variable for the function call to be used as the return value if it's going to return a value. Okay, let's go back. Oh, yep. Okay, good. I'm good you saw. Glad you saw that. So I am, what time is that? Okay. Um, what was that? That was, yes. So, 
five, whoops, wrong one, five, three, three. So, um, I don't know that I need to do anything else with this. If you guys want me to walk through this in the code, I will. But I, I, I think the, the slide said it all. So put something in the chat if you actually want me to walk through that in the code. Um, I'm going to continue on. Okay. We're going to take a foray into objects. Now, we're not going to learn how to create our own objects until week eight. But right now, we want to talk about objects a little bit because a function is an object. Well, what's an object? An object has three properties. It has a type, it has an identity, and it has a value. Okay? The type is generally uh, the return that comes from it. The identity is the name. And the value is the information that's inside the function. So a function is an object, and truly everything in Python is an object. So the function name has the identity, the parameters have the values, and the type is from the return. So that's just to say that functions are objects, and to begin the process of thinking about things as objects. So you always got to remember, identity, value, parameters, sorry, identity, value, and type make an object, and a function is just one kind of it. So I just, I've been talking, I probably should have put this in the beginning. I've been talking a little bit about scope. I talked a little bit about scope starting in week three. We're just going to remember that the scope dictates when the variable is available. You have local and global. We don't care about built-in, that's a Python thing. Everything inside of a function needs to be in the local scope. Okay. Um, I don't think we need to do much of this. So the function name is in the global scope. The parameters are in the local scope. The lines of code are in the local scope. And the return lets you take something from the local scope and assign it to the global scope. And the fu a function can be called from any scope. It doesn't have to be the global scope. It can be, you can call a function from another function. You can call a function from a branch. You can call a function from a loop. You can call a function from a loop inside of another function. Functions can be called from anywhere as long as they have been defined previously. And arguments. All of these arguments are in the same scope as the function call. So right now, pyramid volume is in the global scope, so length, width, and height are going are in the global scope as well. Okay. Arguments and mutability. So this is a swap function. Maybe it's something like you're going to have to do when you're doing your labs. So what is mutability? Well, mutability means it can be changed. So how am I going to swap this? How am I going to change it? Well, I'm going to, here I've got a list. Um, we know a little bit about lists, but I'm going to swap the values in my list to being something else. So I'm going to input my values. I'm going to call swap with my list because anything can be, a function. Anything can be an argument in a function call. It can be a list, it can be an object, it can be a string, it can be none. So here is what I have here, good things just end all. And I want to swap that around. So I'm going to create a temporary variable. Oh, that was in the wrong order. Okay, I'm going to create a temporary variable and I'm going to set the first value in the list to the temporary variable. I am then going to set um, the first to, it should have been one, to the last one. My bad. This is wrong. That swap minus one. Anyway, and then I'm going to set the length of swap minus one to 
the temporary value, and that's where we will have swapped it. My apology for the slide being kind of wrong. Um, if arguments are mutable, they can change, um, and they they can change so that you can make them. Um, sorry, brain brain uh, yeah brain just wasn't working right. So if arguments are mutable. Um, they can be changed. So a list is a mutable thing, and I passed in list to swap, and because it's mutable, I don't have to have a return. Lists can be changed, they are objects, and when I am actually changing that object around, it's changing it in the same place in memory. So values and list to swap are pointing to the very same space in memory where that list occurs. So I don't actually have to return something. Now, I'm neurotic when I code. If I know something's coming out, I, I, would, I would probably put a return here and Python would optimize it out. But that is just to know that if you have types that are mutable, object lists, dictionaries, you don't have to return. They will automatically change because Python is just going to point to that same space in memory where that is held. Okay, default parameter values. Remember when I said you have to have the same number of param arguments as parameters? I lied. Um, you don't actually have to if you use default parameter values. And I personally use default parameter values quite often because sometimes there are different reasons why I'm calling something. And I don't always want to remember that pennies needs to be zero if I'm not passing in pennies. So I can basically, in the definition, say, hey, if somebody isn't passing in pennies, they're going to be zero. If somebody's not passing in the second argument, the second argument becomes zero. So, um, that's just a parameter with a default value. So it's a different syntax. I have the variable name, which is going to be pennies. I have an equal sign and zero. And what this tells Python to do is, if someone does not pass in two arguments, if they only pass in one, the, that argument will be dollars, excuse me, and pennies will always be zero. So I can basically just print number of pennies. I'm going to input an integer, it's going to be 4. I'm going to calculate 4, and it's going to come out as um, 400 pennies. And it's going to be returned, and it's going to be print. So now, what if I do both? So I'm going to input 5, and I'm going to input 6, and then Five is going to end up being my dollars because it's positional. Six is going to end up being my pennies. So I'm going to end up with 506. And that's because Python only uses that default value if you're not passing in the right number of arguments. I'm passing in two arguments in this example. So Python's going to use what I put for both arguments. Now, there's one thing to remember about default parameter values. Um, the variables, no, the parameters with default values have to come after parameters without default values in the order of the arguments. So I could not have said pennies equals zero, comma dollars. That would be a syntax error. Python won't let me do it. But I can say dollars, comma, pennies equals zero because I'm using the, the, the parameter with a default value at the end of my definition, or at least after any of the parameters with that don't have default values have been defined. Okay. Um, yeah. So you don't need to, if it's got a default value, you don't need to include it, which is when we talk about the range function. Last week we talked about the range function, and on one of the slides, you know, I said start, stop, 
increment. And start and increment were optional. And I only had to call it with one value, and that was the stop value. And that's because if you look at the definition of the range function that Python gives you, there are default values. The default value for increment is 1. The default value for start is 0. So I don't have to worry about, um, yeah, I don't have to worry about, for the range function, always putting three values in. So they must be listed in the function definition after all parameters without defaults. OK. You can have multiple return values. So we're just going to move some things around here. And we're going to have um, list 1 and list 2. List 1 is 1, 2, 3. List 2 is 3, 4, 5. And we're just going to move some things around. So I'm setting up list 1 and list 2. And by the way, you'll notice that these are explicit. I didn't set a, va a, a variable. So I can pass a value as an argument to a function. So I'm now going to swap a few things. And the important part here is that once I've swapped them, I can return two different variable values from my move it function. So this it becomes interesting because very few languages allow you to do that. Even in Java, I would have to create another structure. I'd have to create a list of lists to return them. Python doesn't make you do that. Python allows you to return as many elements as you want in a return statement. Now, if you've got a whole lot, you probably want to put them in as some kind of a structure. But this is used all the time. We use this all the time to return multiple variables. Again, multiple things in the return is positional. So list 1, which is the value that we're returning, is going to go into L1. And list 2 is going to go to L2. It's positional. If I'd swapped list 2 and list 1, then the values in the global scope for L1 and L2 would also have been swapped. Um, and then we're just going to print list 1 and print list 2. OK, so they're positional, and Python is unique in languages. So let's start talking about um, what we have to do for the labs this week. Lab 5.18, you have to write a function. And that function is to swap values. And basically what you're going to do is you're going to take parameter 1 and parameter 2. And you're going to set parameter 1 into temp and parameter 2 um, is parameter 1 is then going to equal parameter 2. Parameter 2 is going to equal temp. And I'm going to return both of them. And this is what I'm looking for when I grade this. I want to see both of those return values. And I want to make sure you know what it is you're doing when those return values come out. So below is the main function. And we're going to start thinking about using main functions. Now, there are special functions that Python has defined. And one of them is main. And this is, this is a way to call it. You don't necessarily, whoops. There you go. You don't necessarily have to define a main per se. What this does is it tells Python, hey, don't run anything until you get to me. And then when you get to me, run stuff. Um, so that's all that line is. And you don't actually have to have it in this. But um, it's good to start thinking about that. So I have two user input values. And then I'm going to basically set Output 1 and output 2 is going to equal the swap of user input 1 and user input 2. And then I'm going to output 1 and output 2. Seems simple, but you all of those different, um, all the different talks we've had about positional for both return and for parameters comes into play here. OK, so 5.19 is very similar to um, 
something we did in three when we had all those if statements and we were dealing with floors and dollars and quarters. This is pretty much exactly the same except we are creating a function. Okay? That function is called exact change and it is the portion of that lab in three that actually does the calculations. It figures out the number of dollars, number of quarters, number of dimes, number of nickels, and the number of pennies, and then it returns them. So you'll see down at the bottom of this screen I have returned dollars, quarters, dimes, nickels, and pennies. So in this particular instance, in this function, I have one, two, three, four, five return values that are coming back. So I have a place to put them when they come back. And where do I put them? I put them in um, different variables that are that are set up. And there's again a single equal sign. So I would have dollars, comma quarters, comma dimes, comma nickels, comma pennies, the equal sign, and then exact change user input. So that's how that looks, and it's all done on one line. Okay, and now I'm just going to do the output. The output is identical to what you were doing in three in, can't remember the exact lab in, in module three, but it's the exact same thing. If you got that part correct, leave it alone. If you didn't and you're one of my students, contact me. And if you didn't and you're not one of my students, try and reach out to your professor and find out how you can make that better. And also, I think that Sense is working, so you should be able to get live feedback from Sense. That might be helpful. So that's 5.19, and the real change here is that you're dealing with a function, and then you're dealing with the return from that function, and it's just a lot of return. There are five of them. Okay, yes, questions? Okay. Why is it failing? Number of pennies equal dollar comma pennies. Uh, is this the right indentation? AJ? Ah, it was his iBook there. Okay. Um, values of... Yeah, that was wrong. That minus, long, minus one was just wrong. Okay. We're good with that. So does anybody have any other questions tonight? Is there anything you want to talk about? You're welcome to open up the mics at this point and ask any questions. I know you've got to start, you're starting to be curious about um, the, the small game that you're going to do next week and the big game that's due on, in Module 7 or after Module 7 in Week 8. Um, so do you guys have any questions about that? Okay. Why people think functions are more readable. <laughs> you don't find them more readable. Functions are about organization. For me, they make code uh, readable because... Um, how do I want to put it? If you have, if you didn't have functions, you would have to copy your code to lots of different places sometimes. And that, in fact, introduces errors. Every time you copy a line of code to someplace else, you are, in, you are introducing the potential of an error because you have to remember to fix it in both places or in 10 places. So functions are basically drawing a box around some code and making it usable by name. Now, functions may not necessarily make the code more readable, re readable, especially if you're not naming your functions well. This is one of those things where naming a function is important. You don't want to name a function, just do it. It doesn't tell you anything about the functions. Exact change tells you a little bit about the functions. Um, so I, I don't, I think functions make your code more readable because you're not having to 
decide when you read that section of code what it's doing. You know that you just looked at exact change, you know what exact change does, and every time you read the code and you see the words exact change, you're going to know what exact change does. Plus, it reduces the amount of code that you have to write and maintain. And that's truly the value of reusability in functions, is that you are reducing the code footprint. And that's just better all around. Does that help? understanding what this one wants. User-defined functions make a program easier to understand. Okay. Um, it just does. <laughs> Zybooks 571. Is that one of the participation activities? Okay, let's take a look at it real quick. Okay. Um, five, don't look at that, um, 5.7.1, 7, okay, okay, for any, why does, where did you get that question? Analyzing the eBay function. Let me look again. Did I do that right? Chat. Okay. 5.7.1. User-defined functions make a program easier to understand. Let's look at that again. Okay. I don't see the question. Am I missing something? Okay. Example. Numbers program with example functions. Okay. I got to go down far enough. Ah, okay. So here when you look at this, there's a lot of stuff going on. Okay. You've got a get numbers function. You've got a print all numbers print odd numbers, print negative numbers. So there's just a bunch of different things that are happening. And I could have very well said get numbers and put it down here. When I'm looking at my executing code, okay, get numbers is somewhere else. Now, what we don't get into a lot in this class because we're really talking about the basic mechanics is that print negative numbers may be called a hundred times in your code. So, um, and more importantly, get numbers may be called a hundred times in your code. Um, and for your, what you guys are going to be doing, um, move rooms is going to be called every single time Professor Lisa puts in a direction. So that code that would be in move rooms is going to be called again and again and again and again and again. And it makes it easier to read. If I'm reading a fun if I'm reading a large program, because we review each other's code in my company, so we have to read large programs. And I don't necessarily want to see the same code again and again and again. I would like to see a well-defined function name that I can go out, I can research, I can come back, and I can know it. So I understand why right now it seems more um, readable to you to have get numbers and things down here. But when I read these lines of code down here, I see that I'm getting some numbers. I'm going to print all numbers. I'm going to print all. I'm going to print odd numbers, and I'm going to print negative numbers. That gives me a set of steps. So, does this help at all? I hope that helped. Uh, where is the chat? Okay. Where's chat? 
stuff down here. Okay, cool. I'm glad you understand what they want. I'm confused on when to use the return function or not. How do I know where it's sending the data that it's returning? I think I'm just confused on return in general. Okay, that's completely okay. So let's go out and look at the pyramid function again. Or is there a better one? What's that one? That one returns one. That one doesn't. That one returns one. Okay. Um, so we'll just go back to this one. Okie dokie. So we've got, this is challenge 5.15. And um, we're going to, we're going to um, basically convert miles per hour and minutes into miles. That's what we're doing here. And here I have a nice return statement. So why do I want to return something from this function? That's the first question. The reason I want to return something is because this function has a specific calculation. That's what it's holding. And I want to get that information back so I can act on it in some other way. You know, and we can change this program and I'll show you a little bit about what that other way is. So, um, so that's what I want. I've got a specific calculation. I don't want this calculation going around and around and around in my code. So I'm going to call mph and minutes to miles whenever I want to make this calculation. Let's say I'm programming um, a red light camera. And I need to do this calculation um, to figure out, I don't know, distance. Or better yet, I'm, uh, oh, that's better. I'm running a GPS program, and I know how fast they're going, and I know how long it's taken, them, and now I want to know how many miles they've gone. Best one I got, so let's just go with it. So I want to say miles, I'm going to say miles per hour, I'm going to say minutes traveled, and then I'm going to call the function. And right now I'm going to print it out, but let's do something with that in a second. So let me do this, edit the configuration, 5.5.1, okay, there it is. Okay, so we have my, my, my best friend, the debugger, let me move this over some. So I'm going to debug, I get miles per hour, so I'm going to put in a miles per hour, so I'm going to put in uh, 60 miles per hour, and I'm going to say I've been going for 120 minutes. Okay, so now I'm going to step into miles per hour because I just want to see its calculation. So I'm going to step in, step over. I've got my miles traveled. It's 120. So I now need to do something with that. So what's going to happen here is this miles traveled Actually, let's see if looking at the variables will help. So when I return, because right now I'm in the local scope, so the only variables you will see are the variables from the scope that I am in. Um, and I'm going to return that, and it's going to go to miles. So this miles returned, 120, is going to show up in miles. And it's going to show up there because I have a return statement here. I have the function call to the right of the single equal sign and a variable named miles to the left. It could have been named X, it could have been Fred. The name doesn't matter. It's just the placeholder that we have for that value. So when I step over this last return line, First thing you're going to see in PyCharm is you're going to see um, all of this stuff change. Um, is it the same as saying assign? Let, let me see what you just said. Um, assign miles with miles traveled. Yeah, that's a good way to say it. Let's 
Let's go back here. Okay, there. And so now I'm going to step over, and as soon as I step over line 12, you will see that miles is now defined at 120. And then I can print miles, and I'm done. Now maybe I wanted to, to figure out if they were speeding, if they weren't going to make their trip in time. So I could then use this variable miles and do some other calculations with it. But I've encapsulated the actual calculation to go from miles per hour and minutes to miles. Does that help the explanation a bit? Do you think you have it? Okay, good. Anybody else have any questions about these assignments? Anything else you've got questions on or um, the upcoming assignments? Okay, going once, going twice. I'm glad that I was able to help you understand, Tom. And this should be up tomorrow on the YouTube channel along with all of the other information, including the lab pseudocode and the scripts. So I hope everybody has a nice evening, and I will talk to you guys later.